Uh, good day to everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Palmer. I'm the president of the Filipino American Association of the Inland Empire. With me uh, today is uh, the vice president, Jesse Cadigan. And uh, we have the rare opportunity, uh, not only as an organization, but um, as uh, individuals, to be able to sit and begin an interview with retired Major Edward S. Farmer here in the, the, the wonderful city of Spokane Valley in Washington State. Um, his story goes back to 1944 uh, with his, his, uh, his experiences in the Philippines. And that's where I would like to pick up the story, Ed, of, uh, of you and what what you experienced in the Philippines in the liberation of, of uh, I believe, in Gatabato. Is that correct? Well, also, that's another, that's another phase altogether. Okay. Uh, we arrived in the Philippines from New Guinea on the uh, 20th of October, 1944. My regiment, a regimental combat team, was separated from the rest of the whole task force going into Lady. We were sent to an island called Pernoa, Pernoan Island. It's way on the southern tip of Lady oh to capture a Japanese PT base in an airfield. The Ships dropped us off and left us. The next night, well, late in the afternoon of the next day, the whole Japanese fleet sailed by us, oh, going up Surigao yeah. uh, Strait. And that's when the big battle took place with the naval forces. We were sitting on the island watching that whole battle between the two navies and it lasted on through the night and we had 45 American PT boats with us and they were going back and forth reloading with torpedoes and everything mm -hmm. and going back out. The next morning after the battle ended and the Japanese fleet had turned and went back down Surigao Straits to get away, mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, many Japanese sailors that had, the ships had been destroyed that were coming ashore or the PT boats were picking them up out of the water and bringing them into Punoan Island. And um, the next day after that, the ships came and picked us up and took us back up to join the rest of the division, the 24th Infantry Division. And uh, we landed and went into Karagara in, in the Lady. Mm -hmm. The first action that we had as uh, the 21st Infantry mm -hmm. was our third battalion had been sent up on Breakneck Ridge. I remember seeing a picture of that. In, uh, in Lady, which turned out to be the most decisive and backbreaking of the Japanese army really on Lady was we took Breakneck and and held it against some of the best military divisions in the Japanese army. How long did it take sent. 
How long did it take to uh, capture Breakneck? It was well over a month. Really? Yes, that that lasted a long. Uh, I was uh, there until November 9th uh, when I was wounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was evacuated out from uh, uh, Lady to a general hospital in, on Biak Island, which is down near, uh, back near New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there for a little over a month before I was returned uh, back uh, to Lady. Uh, when I got back to to Lady, the 24th had been relieved uh, mainly from all combat at that time because we were ordered to go to the island of Mindoro. Mm -hmm. yeah, We landed on Mindoro and uh, captured the airfields on Mindoro. Uh, Japanese battleships appeared for a very short time and we were expecting an invasion against us. But for some reason they shelled us some and they left. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it was odd. Yeah, boy, were we happy that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were happy yeah. that they pulled pulled off and left us. Yeah, uh, we took care of all the remnants of what was left mm -hmm. on Mindoro Island, and then my battalion, First Battalion, Twenty First Infantry. Uh, we were ordered to uh, make an amphibious landing on the island of Lubang, mm -hmm. which is close to the mouth of the entrance into uh, Manila, Manila Bay. Mm -hmm. It was a Japanese Air Force base at that time. We went in and, and uh, cleaned it cleaned out everybody there and uh, we could fly some of our smaller planes uh, from fighter planes mm -hmm. from Lubang after that. Uh, we returned from Lubang to Mindoro and we started preparations for the invasion of Mindanao. Mm -hmm. Um, April, I believe it was April 15th that we made the amphibious landing at Cotabato. Mm. Uh, that was a very odd because the Japanese were expecting us to be landing on the opposite side no. of oh. Mindanao at Davao area. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. uh, as I always have said, the, the genius that MacArthur was, he always had them fooled as to what was really going to happen. Uh, my battalion was one of the lead battalions that went into Cotabato. Uh, if it may I were. We took LCI's landing craft infantry up I, the river. I'm trying to think of the name of that that river. It was deep enough and wide enough that the LCI's, which were rather flat bottom, right. to be able to go up the river and take us up quite a few miles. Mm. The LCI that was ahead of the one I was on, didn't quite make this one turn 
and ran into this bank and there were three, at least three Nipu shacks or whatever Nipu that was up on yeah. the Nipu top yeah. of the bank. Yeah. Right. And all of a sudden, people were falling all over the place into the river. Mm. They, that was one of so so you were traveling up the the river i i assume quite fast yes for yes. for one of these lcis yeah. not to be able to make the turn and you know, well, take out a nipa hut <laughs> i think he probably got told a little about his steering <laughs> capabilities later on yeah. but that was that was one of the i think one of the funniest ex experiences mm -hmm. Uh, I had that. And that that LCI, yeah, LCI. That LCI was in front of yours. Yeah. Uh, the one that you yeah. were in. I see. And so we drove all the Japanese out of uh, Cotabato. Mm -hmm. uh, the first night that we were uh, after the landing, I was the battalion S three for the first battalion. My job, I was the plans and training. Uh, so that's what the S3 is. Of, uh, oh, and um, one of the companies hadn't reported in. So the battalion commander said, Farmer, go find out where the hell they are. If, and you know, get them located. So my driver and I, and our Jeep, we, took off down the road. And of course we had our blackout lights only. Uh, had the windshield down, of course. Mm -hmm. And I was leaning over the windshield, seeing if I could pick up any, any movement mm -hmm. out in uh, front mm -hmm. uh, troops of any kind. Right. And it, all of a sudden, there was a terrible explosion, and we were just entering on, onto a bridge, mm -hmm. and the Japanese blew the bridge up oh right in, in front of my driver and I. Uh, I was blown about 20 feet in the air, just out and landed on my back out, and. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't breathe, and my driver came running down, and I'm oh, oh, yeah. trying to get some breath, and he picked me up and put me back in the Jeep. We backed up, turned around, and went back up that same road, and we get challenged. That was odd that they would yeah. challenge uh, Well. I recognized the sergeant because I'd been his company commander for a short time. And I, I was really mad. <laughs> I, I said, how come you didn't stop us when we went through here? And he said, well, I thought you knew where you were going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just let us go yeah. right out in it into the night yeah and uh, finally the next day we took off and we made that crossing of mindanao the fastest and the longest at that time of any battle all the way across to the east coast of of uh, Mindanao and then turn north from the highway there into uh, Davao uh, how long was uh, how long did that take you Ed? I think it took us it was either two and a half or three days to go across, we fought all the way across 
and uh, separated all the Japanese forces. Mm -hmm. uh, when we got into Davao, um, 21st Infantry, we were sent to an area called Mintal. That was one of the most heavy fortified areas of all right in, in the Davao area. The 19th Infantry went into Davao and our 34th Infantry was in between the 21st and we were all at advancing. Well, we got stopped at the uh, Tolomo River because they had that other across the bank so heavily fortified with, with trenches and uh, pillboxes and, and everything that we fought for three or four days at least before we finally got the first company across the river and into the higher ground mm -hmm. uh, across the, the river. Um, that was some of the heaviest fighting next to Breakneck Ridge that we, the 21st, encountered. It was uh, a real uh, tough experience. Uh, are, uh, you, are you willing to uh, share some of the uh, those horrendous uh, battles? Well, the uh, 21st Infantry uh, we for some reason at times ended up being in the front and uh, the other two regiments really had their problems it's the same as as we did mm -hmm. but it was uh, mental for some reason the Japanese just didn't want to give that area up for any reason hmm. uh, did you ever find out why after um, getting through that no not really why that they considered that so important but uh, they considered that as important evidently as they did trying to take break it neck ridge and keep it yeah. uh, all the troops going into lady for reinforcement were landed at or mock hmm. until finally the Navy uh, did so much damage that they could no longer bring in any um, more troops. And of course, the Japanese never got any additional troops added hmm. uh, on Mindanao. And after two weeks of fighting in the Mental area, we finally broke through their defenses and drove them. And they were driven into many parts of Mindanao as you know, that were completely unexplored. Yeah. And they um, uh, were still bringing Japanese out of the jungle, I guess, until 
10 years ago, yeah. I understand. Yeah, they uh, came out of the jungle. But after uh, all that, and we were pulled back. We fought 72 straight days from the time that we landed at uh, Cotabato until the war was supposedly over. But in the, uh, after we had broken out of Mental, and we were pulled out, and my battalion, the 1st Battalion, 21st, we made the last amphibious landing of World War II at Sarangani Bay, mm -hmm. which is way down in southern uh, Mindanao. Um, uh, while we were preparing to make that landing, the regimental commander said, uh, Farmer, you take a recon flight down to see what you can pick up, maybe on the beaches or whatever. And uh, I flew down there with a Marine pilot and captain, and it was a two seater F 4U something. Mm. Uh, and uh, small little prop we job. had two yeah. yeah we had two other planes as escort for protection while we were so we get down in the area of Serengeti Bay and <clears throat> we were flying 10 12,000 feet and I said to this marine pilot hey look we came down I'm supposed to see What's on the beach? What it what it looks like? What the hell are we doing up here? You know, ten, twelve thousand feet. I said, "Are you a coward or something?" That was the wrong thing to say, because the next minute, yeah, yeah, we were down, in about fifty feet above, and going yeah, and going yeah. along the beach, and he went back up and repeated that. Well, if you have never been airsick, hope you don't ever get <laughs> because after the first trip, I thought I'd lost everything. The second trip down, I was down to just bile. Oh, man. And I was dry and I couldn't. And... Um, we get back up to the airport, and uh, I've never seen anyone as mad. I, I was just, uh, yeah. rrr, rrr. I couldn't do anything else. And he unstrapped me, pulled me out of the cockpit, down on the wing, down on the ground. He's kicking me a couple of times. And tell me, get up and fight. They'll call me a coward. And, and I'm still laying there. And so he went into the hangar, and the driver said, What did you do with my captain? And he swore at him a few yeah. words and said, He's out by the plane. So my driver came up and picked me up and put me in the Jeep and strapped me in. We went back to headquarters and uh, we made the landing. Now, I hate to say this, but as our intelligence at times wasn't very intelligent. Yeah. They told us at the time that we made the landing down there. We were just a battalion with uh, artillery attached to combat team, that there were only about 1,200 Japanese in the area, but they had to be cleaned out. Well, the war ended, we heard, but the Japanese, where we were, didn't get the message. Mm. 
and we were still fighting days after supposedly they finally brought a Japanese general down that went back into the hills and convinced the Japanese that the war was over and they brought out, uh, they came out with about 2,200. Oh my goodness. And we'd already killed about a thousand. Oh my goodness. And they, that's how many they brought out. That was long after. We, <laughs> we yeah. kept hearing that the oh, war was yeah. over. Yeah. yeah. Finally it was. Yeah. But uh, that was, um, but while I was on Mindanao, like the uh, dagger. Well, that's, that's why I, I met, uh, for you to tell me the story. I met uh, Colonel Salipada Pendaten. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a colonel in the Philippine Army at that time that had been organized in uh, the Cotabato mm -hmm. area. And uh, we became friends. You know, you meet some people and that, you know, you're friends. Right. It's a, it, so uh, he presented me with this. Uh, his dagger here. Personal also, somewhere I have uh, a sword. The blade's about so long, and it's the regular Moro. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't find That'll what I did with that. Yeah. If I do find it, I will. Um, bring it to you and present it yeah. to you. The, um, I was, uh, I was, you know, I've done some research on my own on, uh, solid, uh, solid data. Solid part of uh, uh, Yeah. Um, and he eventually became a Senator. Yes. I, yeah. And, uh, unfortunately he passed in 1985, uh, after he was injured in a vehicle accident. Oh, and uh, right now I'm attempting to locate family members uh, through the Philippine National Police Camp, which is uh, in Mindanao, uh, I believe in the Gatabato area, that was actually named after him. And there's a min uh, municipality in, uh, near Gatabato, uh, which is also named after him. Uh, he was the first Moro general um, in the Philippine Army, which uh, at that time, or at, you know, is is uh, quite a, a remarkable feat for your friend. And um, and another interesting fact was um, uh, he was at, at being a Muslim and leading uh, his Moro units there. Um, he married a, um, a young lady uh, who was Christian. And um, he is one of uh, probably the only uh, that, that I'm aware of, Muslim, that was married in a Catholic church. Hmm. And uh, he was, was a real pleasant, pleasant person. Well, you know, um, I was uh, looking at the, uh, the letter um, that, uh, that he sent with you. Yeah. When um, you went back up into Gatabato. Yeah. And uh, apparently there was... Um, Captain Aiken. Yeah. Uh, he died several years ago. Okay. Aiken did. But I was amazed at um, uh, his, um, his articulation in this um, uh, letter. Uh, you know, it, it, it appeared to have been written by a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that um, uh, the lineage of uh, um, Salapeda was uh, that he actually was um, educated uh, by a gentleman uh, uh, that was uh, there uh, for uh, when, when uh, MacArthur was like the governor. Yes. 
of, uh, of, of the Philippines or up in the Manila area, they established some English schools and he actually went uh, for his education under the tutelage of an American. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been a fascinating um, uh, uh, research for me to look into this gem uh, gentleman and um, the wonderful things that he has done uh, uh, while he was, um, uh, he was actually the governor, he was the appointed governor of Gatapato after the war. And uh, he was appointed by the, uh, at that time, the, uh, I guess the, the government, uh, the U.S. government, when they were uh, there in in uh, Luzon in Manila, so it was. It's been a very fascinating. And this, this, um, Ed is truly a remarkable um, uh, piece uh, uh, artifact. And and um, I brought it back uh, today to um, ask you. Um, if you would like, and I and I know I read your letter uh, that you sent uh, to to the um, governor to the governor uh, in Gatapato, and um, his response. Um, uh huh. Her. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was. It was. Um, Mendoza. Yeah. From uh, uh, Tolino Mendoza. It, and in the, the return uh, letter, it, it addressed the provincial gover uh, government of North Gatapato. Deserves most to receive and secure such historical dagger, being the mother province before the same was subdivided in the uh, provinces of North Gatapato, South Gatapato, Sultan Karat, and I want to say uh, Maguindanao. Magindano. Oh, Magindano. 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 Thank you. <laughs> and uh, that's why I brought Jesse along, so he could <laughs> interpret. Um, but uh, it, it, it appeared that the government wanted it more than them even um, notifying family members. So uh, what I've done is I've tried to reach out through the Philippine National Police Camp uh, to locate actual relatives and communicate with them directly. Now, I'm sure that you would like to return this to the family. Oh, yes, I would, uh, if you can locate, yeah, that's what I I'm feel doing that right they, now. I feel that they would probably want that, uh, even though the uh, Cotabato government may want it for a museum yeah. that the family, if they desire, could then present it to, that, that is correct. to the fam to the government. Yeah. Um, but I'll leave that up to you to uh, well, that's, um, to um, decide anything. Yes. Um, uh, uh, Jesse, Jesse and I have discussed on how to properly display this. Uh, and we've talked about a shadow box, but we've also discussed about, um, you know, as soon as we make contact with family members, um, our attempts will be, uh, is to actually return it ourselves to the family members. That'd be great. Uh, uh, and, uh, and we will, we'll, we will work on that, um, uh, constantly from now on. Uh, but Yes, it's, it's a very prized possession, and uh, I want to thank you very much for allowing us the opportunity as an organization, uh, the Filipino American Association of the Inland Empire, uh, a rare, rare opportunity to be able to um, uh, somehow get this back to the family. It, it, it is quite an honor. So. I, as I say, I leave it in your hands. Well, thank uh, you. I just felt that it should be back with, if I was uh, offered a couple of hundred dollars for it once, oh. but I, I just uh, felt that it should go uh, yeah. back there to a relative or uh, yeah, we we uh, we uh, certainly. Uh, yeah, it's uh, absolutely remarkable. Um, 
now I'm I'm returning this, and this mm -hmm. is the only reason why I'm returning this, yeah. is to get your signature on this. Oh. So I'm going to want you to sign this, but um, tell me if you don't mind. Um, yeah. I I um, I saw your interview, but it was um, the translation over uh, your interview on this. I couldn't hear your words, oh. and I certainly don't understand Japanese. <laughs> uh, I have, and I um, am. And I and I thought maybe I got a copy of that also. This is uh, an interview that was done by a Tokyo TV station, the Midori uh, Yanagahara mm -hmm. came and interviewed me here, and. This is a, a copy. What I've been trying to do is to, am we going to have this retyped? Um, she was here also for the Battle of Breakneck Ridge. Oh, really? So that yes. was the, this is all about Breakneck Ridge? Yeah. Oh. And that's uh, all this interview here mm -hmm. is all about uh, Breakneck Ridge. I also, she gave me, and I'm trying, I put it somewhere. She interviewed all the veteran survivors that she could get a hold of in Japan of the Battle of the Lady. And if you want to read something pitiful, you should read what these Japanese soldiers went through. We beat them up so badly that they didn't have food. They were cannibalizing. Uh, they were left uh, without medical care. They were dying alongside the road because Nobody seemed to seem to care. Um, I have one little incident. That it was very difficult to get a Japanese prisoner. Very difficult. They didn't want to be taken prisoner because if they were taken prisoner, they were no longer a member of the Japanese race. So I got a call from this company commander. He said, uh, Ed, he said, we have a prisoner. I said, that's great, Ted. So I called the regimental commander, Colonel Verbeck, who as a younger man had uh, spent uh, as an attache to the Japanese army, spoke very good uh, Japanese, mm. of course. And so I called regimental headquarters and uh, I got a hold and I said, Bill, we got a prisoner down here. And he said, okay, Ed, I'll be right down. So I hung up from talking to the regimental commander and uh, in came a call. Ted said, uh, oh, Ed, <laughs> he said, uh, do you remember that prisoner we had? I said, what the hell are you talking about? We had, he said, well, he just died of starvation. Oh my goodness, jeez. But uh, I said, will you tell Bill when he gets to your headquarters how he died because I'm not going to be around. Mm. But I uh, subsequently found out that uh, 
a patrol coming in saw the Japanese alongside the road and the reaction was immediate. They shot him mm. before anybody in the company could tell him that he was a prisoner. They didn't have a guard on him mm. for some reason. But uh, I've never known anybody as mad as Bill Verbeck was when he found out that the prisoner had died of starvation. My goodness. Uh, what other uh, your 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 military history, um, you know, stretches from Leyte up outside Manila, back around to Gatabato, up across Mindanao, up into Davao. Uh, Seventy-two straight days of fighting. Yeah, uh, you were wounded. Uh, there, uh, I was wounded in Leyte, and Leyte. I was also uh, wounded again on uh, Mindanao, uh, down in Sarangani. Uh, I was talking with my sergeant, S3 sergeant, and uh, I was going to send him off to a company, and all of a sudden, this uh, shell, I found out later, it was one of the 25 millimeter cannon uh, shells. And uh, the piece, I had just reached up to wipe the sweat. And uh, this piece of shrapnel toward threw my helmet, tore my helmet off, knocked me down and cut my hand here and I got uh, the, oh. uh, where it, uh, but it uh, really, how uh, one little piece of shrapnel like that has that much, much strength, but then of course the helmet, you know, yeah going banging against my head and everything uh, is the reason I lost, I guess, you know. Is that the when you lost your sight, Ed, you know, for two days? When you lost your sight, you know, able to see? Well, that was another thing in the mental area. Uh, okay. uh, the battalion commander, we were being shelled heavily, and uh, the battalion commander said, uh, Ed, come over. I want to discuss something with you. I said, Colonel, I can hear you plainly from here. What the hell are we going to discuss? He said, come over here. I want to talk to you. So I started to get up out of my slit trench, and the shell came in. And uh, the next thing I knew, I was blinded. Just. And uh, I went back down in my slit trench and uh, laid there for two days because we were surrounded and there's no way of getting any of it. We wounded out. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of days later, uh, another big shell came in near where my slit trench was and just practically, you know, lifted me out of the ground, slammed me down, and damped my sight <laughs> and come back. Really? Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? I, I just, you know, I couldn't believe that. Uh, it, so from, how long? Uh, how it was long concussion. After, yeah. How long after that were you able to uh, get your way out of that? No, well. Uh, I didn't go back anywhere then mm. because I could see again, so yeah. uh, but I just stayed. You guys were surrounded. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take you to get out? Well, of they finally brought uh, a couple of companies in from another unit mm -hmm. that opened up oh. so that uh, we were almost out of all supplies and ammunition and food and everything. 
uh, we were down to uh, one K ration a day uh, for three or four days. Wow. Uh, and that uh, was really I can't tell you how I felt laying there and lay in the rain because we had no nothing else except ponchos you know in those days too mm -hmm. that was our tent and everything else it was the poncho and uh, but I know what a relief it was that all of a sudden I could see again yeah Wow. Now, um, Ed, you are the recipient of the Silver Star. Yes. And may I ask um, the accommodation for that? What, 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 uh, what action did you see that? That was on Lady, up on Breakneck Ridge. Um, the first man killed in. Uh, lady when we rejoined the division was the company commander of A Company, Lieutenant Bill Hughes. Um, A Company had been sent up breakneck to try to uh, open up the rear so that the 3rd Battalion could withdraw from the positions where they were. Uh, they were really getting the hell kicked out of them, and they wanted to pull the 3rd Battalion back. But they couldn't get back because they were surrounded. Mm. So A Company was to go and relieve the pressure on the back, but in the same time, A Company got surrounded. Mm. And they were really being decimated. Lost, A Company lost five officers that day and was down to one officer. Uh, I was a battalion adjutant at that time. And the uh, um, battalion commander said, uh, Farmer, you're in command A Company. Go find them. I said, Major, where are they? He said, That's your job to find them. <laughs> this, <laughs> this goes back to the day with this major when he was the second lieutenant in H Company of the 21st Infantry. And I was a platoon sergeant in H Company, 21st Infantry. And uh, he told the company commander a lie. And the company commander asked me, he said, Farmer, what's your story? I told him. So he said to the second lieutenant, he said, if you ever lie to me again, you're out of here. Well, when I left the 21st in 41, uh, when I went back and rejoined the 21st Infantry in New Guinea mm -hmm. in January 44, I'm a first lieutenant. My ex-company commander is a lieutenant colonel commanding the 1st Battalion, 21st. The executive officer is Major Leahy. Oh, my. And we still don't like each other. <laughs> but as long as Jock, the battalion commander, was around, I was in safe territory. Yeah, yeah. But he went back to the States on emergency leave when he came back uh, in Lady, 
they assigned him to the 34th Infantry Regiment. And so now he is the battalion commander for sure. And I had uh, the young man that uh, he said, uh, I, it was the first lieutenant, he said, Lieutenant, he said, I know where the company is. I got out. Uh, I said, okay, tell me where, and, and uh, I'll go up. And he said, well, you're my company commander. I'm going with you. So we took off up this trail and everything, and uh, we managed to fight our way in, and I took command of A Company at that time. Mm. Um, I got the company organized, we fought our way out, and uh, we rejoined the, the battalion and were sent in to another area on Breakneck Ridge. And uh, I gave you the pictures of the, the logs and the yes. fall and all that. Well, we went up that trail going up to the top of the, that ridge and got in in on top. And when we got up to the top of the ridge, it was all Kogan grass, eight, you know, oh my. 10 feet high. That stuff was terrible. Yeah. And uh, we um, dug in uh, when we got up there. And I uh, was told to send out a patrol, so I had one lieutenant left. I sent him out with 25 men to reconnoiter out in front. And pretty soon the patrol came back in, and they didn't come back with the lieutenant or one of the scouts had been killed. And so I immediately uh, formed another patrol and we went out to the area and we got out there about uh, 25, 50 yards, something. And I came across, we were going on a trail there, we ran across the, another trail. So I sent the two scouts across the trail and they said, just stay until I tell you differently. So um, I started up the trail and there was the lieutenant and there was the scout. So I called and got some men. They came and got the lieutenant and, and got the scout and got them out. And just after that happened, I straightened up and was starting to walk up this trail. And uh, about 20, 25 feet right in front of me was this Japanese patrol. Uh, you know, being John Wayne, I snapped off the first round from my car being happened to hit the lieutenant and killed him. Uh, I pulled the trigger again, nothing happened. I looked down, my car being a jam, that round was looking right up at me out of the, yeah. and uh, evidently that guy up there wasn't ready for me yet because laying right on the ground was the Tommy gun that the scout had dropped when he was killed. Mm. And I picked up the Tommy gun, which had two magazines, one up and one down. Mm -hmm. They had 30 rounds each. And I couldn't believe it, that patrol was still stand there because nobody had told them to do something. They always had to wait. Oh, Thank that I didn't have to think about anything yeah, like that. Right. So I just picked up the Tommy gun and, 
and I, I killed that patrol. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, a machine gun behind them opened up on me, and uh, I had just stepped off the trail, and uh, I hit the ground, and some they f fired again, and a couple of the rounds caught me in the left hand here. Mm -hmm. The uh, fingers were all shot up, and almost shot my thumb off and mm. stuff. And, and uh, I, uh, I finished. Oh. Okay, let's uh, take one second here. I gotta take a break. I'm okay. out of tape here. Sorry. No, that's all right. Can I use your uh, restroom? I ate this restroom somewhere. Yes. Would you? Is there a restroom that he could? Yeah. Oh, right, on right out by the front door, turn left. And it's there's right a, there. Yeah. And you can't miss it. My, oh my. How are we doing, Jamie? Fine. That's one hour. Okay. So we're probably would, getting close on that. It's got about 30 minutes left. Oh. Okay. All right. Uh, would you like something? To, uh, do you need anything to drink or no, anything? Think, you no. good? No, I'm fine. Okay. All right. But uh, while you're... I did give you a copy of that, I believe. But while you're... No, I don't have a copy oh, you don't? of it. Okay. You can have that. Thank you. But uh, his, uh, what was written up in the Berkeley, California paper I'll give you a copy of that I don't think it tells me how much is left. But I knew where, when I started it. Okay. I said an hour 40. Okay. One hour right now. So. All right. That is. Yeah. That uh, was what we're talking about here. Yes, yes. And I'm, uh, yeah. I want to pick up the story where we left off. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it is uh, something you might find interesting. Yeah, I seen Carol. That. Okay. Carol and, and I were in Berlin with the uh, breakup in 89 of the Iron Curtain. Really? Yeah. They still had the uh, East German guards were still on the west side of the, the wall patrolling. No, he didn't want anything. But this is, uh, did you see that? Yes. Yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie and I were serving together in late 41 and early 42 at Fort Mason in uh, California.
You were Shanghai into the MPs. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was a to, that was a big insult to me at that time. Okay. Do you have any pictures, Ed, of you when you were in the uh, yeah, service? I've got. Well, when when. Uh, it would be really nice to get to put, you know, during like he's talking, and then we cut from one to the other. Yeah. And of when uh, that picture that I gave you that I'd like your signature, the one. Oh. Uh, you, you, you still know. have it, I believe. So you put them down one in there. I think you're going to need it. Oh, I thought I gave it to him. Yeah. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Oh, yeah. Can you, can you take a shot of that? Or? That, you, was, oh. yeah, that was that. taking the day I... Scan it or something. Yeah. Might be better if yeah, you get scanned. Yeah. That was taking the day I retired from the Army. Really? Yeah. April 30th, 1957. Retired? You don't look <laughs> old enough in this picture to yeah, have retired. Well, you know, Ike was president. Yeah. And he was kicking out. Brigadier generals were going down to Sardin to get their 20 years in to retire. My goodness. So Ron Ronald Reagan was the second lieutenant, right? Hmm? Ronald Reagan was yeah. the second lieutenant? Yeah, we were second lieutenants at the same time. But Ronald became president, but Ed never did. I never got there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, so let's uh, pick up um, on... Uh, well, that's... Uh, I think it left off where I your, your just hand was wounded. yeah I had just been uh, just been hit and uh, I used to carry grenades so I just started throwing grenades uh, uh, second grenade stopped there were no more firing from them after that. Mm. But uh, uh, what it, it happened was that <clears throat> I had saved the control from being wiped out the way they were mm -hmm. coming at us. The, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, they started coming down the trail Toward us after that, hmm. we did manage to get back into battalion headquarters mm -hmm. uh, area in the perimeter before they could really finish us off. Yeah. Um, uh, you also are a recipient of two bronze stars. Yeah. Uh, one was for an action of. Uh, our battalion medics were uh, bringing in some wounded, uh, a battalion surgeon and uh, two litters of wounded. Mm. Um, and the, the Japanese came out of nowhere and started to attack them, and they were three or four of us that uh, I grabbed. I always carry a Tommy gun after my carbine failed me. Yeah. So I just grabbed my Tommy gun there and uh, we ran out there and, and uh, beat off the, and killed a bunch of them that were trying to kill the battalion surgeon and, mm -hmm. and the uh, two uh, the battalion surgeon was killed mm -hmm. later, right after that. Uh, and then 
the other Bronze Star was issued because of the Combat Infantry oh, badge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I received that as an award uh, after I was stationed in uh, Japan. Uh, I was the supply and transportation officer for the Japanese war crimes trials mm. for three years in, in Tokyo. And, uh, oh, yeah. I, uh, but um, the, um, that night after I got, uh, uh, we had the typhoon winds. We understand later were about a hundred and twenty mile an hour. Oh my goodness! And that rain was not coming this way, yeah, but was, yeah. horizontal. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, just like hail. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we could do was we just sit in our slit trenches with our ponchos over us and. Uh, that was the only way you could keep warm. And yet, there was, the Japanese used to wander every night. They never wa wanted us to sleep, I guess. Yeah. And they used to wander into our perimeters and uh, the, nothing worse than when you're about half asleep or at one o'clock in the morning is to hear a yell like they used to scream. One day! Yeah. And that meant, oh, here they come. Yeah. It was, what are you talk about? Yeah. Scared? Yeah. <laughs> you better believe because you never knew where they were. Mm -hmm. 40 feet away or if they were stand right on the edge of your slit trench at the time when you'd hear that yell. Yeah. It uh, was a very uh, disturbing. Yes, I, I would, I would uh... <laughs> Very disturbing. How, uh, you know, uh... Being a, a member of the greatest generation yeah. and what you went through, Ed. Um, and they talk, talk nowadays about, you know, post-traumatic uh, uh, post syndrome. And have you found it difficult with the memories uh, in, in your life? To me, the greatest therapy in the world we have a very division, strong division association. Mm -hmm. And we have had that association since 1946. We go to those reunions and we discuss everything. Uh, we discuss things that were very serious at the time, men were killed. Yet there were some funny things that happened mm -hmm. while they were going on. Mm -hmm. Now we, the best therapy in the world, and it still would be to me, is that they get these young people and they get them like we do at the reunions and just sit and discuss what action and what happened yeah. and how many seriously, how many people were killed and it took away from us uh, because we were all there. Yeah. And it evidently, to me, the only way you ever got out of the South Pacific in World War II New Guinea or the Philippines or anything as far as the army was concerned was 
that uh, you were either killed or so seriously wounded that you couldn't mm. do anything yourself. Mm. Otherwise, like th these and, and my hand and stuff, yeah. patch him up and put him back, yeah. you know. Yeah. And uh, the, um, the, the, this is, it may not mean much, but uh, as an officer, we would charge 25 cents a meal, even during, out there. Really? In combat. We were charged 25 cents a meal. Officers were. Now, we had times, and this sometimes many days, that we had one ration mm -hmm. a day. And so the government was making 50 cents a day off us <laughs> by giving us one ration. And well, it was all part of the war effort. Yeah. Huh? So, well. When uh, somebody tells me how tough they've had it, they haven't had any food, I, I can go along with them because some days we didn't have any food. Yeah. I'm allergic to, fish. to, to turkey tur tur oh, any and fowl. chicken, fowl. Fowl, fowl and chicken. any fowl now. Yeah. We hadn't seen food for four days hardly, except we were almost completely out of K ration. They finally got a carrying party into us and they brought in cases of food. Opened these cans and almost every case they brought in was turkey. Now I was hungry. Yeah. I wanted, and I tried to eat some. Yeah, I broke out in hives. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I know I'm, I don't even think about it. <laughs> and the, the reason Carol and I is married is because I was talking to a friend of mine and uh, I said, he said, well, I'd like to have you come over, you know, for Christmas dinner. I said, well, I'm allergic, you know, to turkey, so you'll have to have some for me. And all of a sudden, this person rushed up and said, "Marry me, and I won't have to cook turkey for Christmas or Thanksgiving." <laughs> <laughs> that good line, Carol. Good line. <laughs> oh but, my. Um, that's, well, that's my theory that, uh, to me, a psychiatrist, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is one of the goofiest guys in the world. The psychiatrists that I ran across during World War II that were examining men and everything, They were, to me, idiots. They had no understanding, really, of what the hell was going on. Yeah. And they're relying, to me, too much on one of these psychiatrists sitting there across from a man when they should be having all of them in group meetings and freely discussing everything that went on. Yeah. There's nothing that relieves that pain more than discussing it. Yeah. I believe you're right. That's why I feel that I can sit and talk about it. Some of my best friends were killed. One of the greatest leaders that I ever served with was First Lieutenant Jock Clifford, Captain Jock Clifford, Lieutenant Colonel Jock Clifford, and Colonel Jock Clifford. I was his platoon sergeant for two years. I was one of his company commanders for, while he was 
with the 21st. Mm -hmm. He's the only man of all my friends that were killed in World War II mm. in the Pacific. Mm. That when I heard that, I sat down and cried. And I bet I cried for 20 minutes at least. Mm. He's the only one of all that affected me like that. They all did. Uh, we still, the last, I can't say that because the last reunion I attended in Buffalo last year, there were only three of us from pre-Pearl Harbor at the, at the reunion. Mm. And so, um, and one of those have died since. Mm. Uh, what made Colonel Clifford, uh, what was it about, about him? He was a man that you followed him. You didn't believe you could be killed. Really? He made you feel that you were going to live and win the battle. Win the battle, of course. Mm -hmm. That uh, it was uh, that's to, uh, I place of all the officers that I ever served with, I placed Jock Clifford number one. I placed our regimental commander that uh, took over in in Lady while we were on Breakneck Ridge, that regimental commander. Bill Verbeck, number two, and believe it or not, I place General MacArthur, number three. He's, to me, the greatest general that ever lived. Mm -hmm. He saved more lives with his intelligence than all the other generals put together. Now, after um, at Mindanao, yeah. Um, did you, by any chance, have an opportunity to go up onto the main island of Luzon? I uh, was uh, appointed as the regimental supply officer for the 21st Infantry on loading the ship to go into Japan. Mm. We uh, arrived in Kure. K U R E, mm -hmm. Japan, and went down the nets, it took the landing craft to Gwinta, Curry, and from there we, uh, my regiment caught a train and we went up to Okayama. Mm -hmm. And I was there in Okayama until December 45 when. They gave me the flu shot for the first time. It was given anybody, they gave it to us. And I ended up with pleurite pneumonia from it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but then uh, I arrived back in the States and uh, I, was, uh, I live in Berkeley, California. I was assigned to Fort McClellan, Alabama. And that's where I found out damn Yankee was one word. And it was absolutely my worst tour of foreign service out of all my 13 years of foreign service. <laughs> I couldn't get out of Alabama fast enough. That's when I went back volunteered and got back to Japan mm. in that early 1947.